is. Jehovah gets pierced. It's in the description box. This is a two-parter. Two-parter. Yeah, he's too much to handle. This is part one, and then there in the bottom will give you the part two. Get ready, guys. Oh, this is going to be music. All right. And here's the link to part two. Jehovah gets pierced. More proof that Zechariah identifies Jesus as Jehovah God according to the New Testament. New Testament, taking Zechariah, what he says about Jehovah God, not a creature, and applied it to Jesus. You ready? This is music. Zechariah 12, verses 1 to 3, 7 to 14, chapter 13, verse 1. You ready? Get ready to be blown away. La Asoteke Asoterica, are you now complaining that I'm not fair? Yeah, don't don't repay him with evil. I made a, a truce with him. Sometimes you gotta stuff a dog with his vomit and humiliate him. Proverbs 26, 5. Okay, you ready? Are we ready? Zechariah 12. Guess who gets pierced? Look who gets pierced. Let's read it. This ties in with Zechariah 14 when Jehovah comes to fight for Israel, the remnant. And by extension, New Testament, the true Israel is the church. If a Jew believes in Jesus, he belongs to Jehovah. The word of Yahweh, pay attention to who's speaking. The word of Yahweh concerning Israel. Thus says Yahweh, who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth <clears throat> and formed the spirit of man within him. Lo, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of reeling to all the peoples round about it. It will be against Judah also in the siege against Jerusalem. On that day, <clears throat> I will make Jerusalem <clears throat> a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it shall grievously hurt themselves. And all the nations of the earth will come together against it. On that day, says Yahweh, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness. So you notice Yahweh, right? Please, guys, focus. I'll say watch the rest of it later. But you got to listen. But upon the house of Judah, I will open my eyes when I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah shall say to themselves, shall say to themselves, the inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through Yahweh of hosts, their God. On that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a blazing pot in the midst of wood, like a flaming torch among sheaves. They will devour to the right, to the left. I'm going to make them like fire. They're going to consume their enemies. Round about while Jerusalem <clears throat> shall stay, still be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. And Yahweh will give victory to the tents of Judah first. Why? He's going to allow Judah to defeat their enemies first. Why? That the glory of the house of David and the glory of the heaven of Jerusalem may not be exalted over that of Judah. Because Judah is the tribe from which the king comes. So God is going to make Judah defeat her enemies first. Pay attention, guys. This is the latter days. Colton, pay attention, brother. Don't change the subject. I've already called him out. And I've told Standing for Truth to set up debates with him. Focus. All right. On that day, Yahweh will put a shield about the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David. Now notice, God is saying, I'm going to make the weakest of them strong like David, who is a warrior. Now watch. This is an argument from the greater, from the lesser to the greater. Guys, if you're not listening, you're not going to catch it. I'm going to make the weakest one, the one who's feeble, the one who's weak. I'm going to make him like David, a warrior. I'm going to make the house of David like God. Did you catch it? God is almighty. I'm going to make the house of David almighty like me. They can't be defeated. They'll be like me. They're going to be like me, right? You see the progression? You're going from the lesser to the greater, right? But now watch proof that the angel is God almighty. So the weakest one will be like David. The house of David like God, almighty like God, unbeatable like God, like the angel of Yahweh at their head. Uh-oh. Hold on here. If you're going from the lesser to greater, why do you go from God to the angel if the angel is a creature and infinitely less than God? That makes no sense. Damn, Stafford. Do you caught it? 
Let me give you an example. What I mean, I'm gonna make Nina like. What's that boxer's name? Damn. Floyd Way Mayweather, like Mike Tyson. I'm going to make Nina like Floyd Mayweather, like Mike Tyson. Floyd Mayweather is great. Mike Tyson will kill him in a fight. So I'm going from the lesser to the greater. Well, you don't get greater than God. He's almighty. But notice Zechariah put the angel of God, Yahweh before God, ahead of God. Blasphemy if he's a creature. But if it's Trinity, glorious. This shows that the angel and God are equal. So you can say, I'm going to make you like God and your strength, like the angel of Yahweh, because they're one God, they're almighty. See what happened here? Wow. Come on, guys. Are you getting it? More proof the angel is not a creature. Yep. Of course he, he knew the angel wasn't a creature and he was God. He says the angel forgives sins and clothes us in righteousness, something only God does. He calls the angel Yahweh. He can move Yahweh to do what he wants, right? Because he's one with Yahweh. And now he and Yahweh are equated in their power. But wait, hold on. We're not done. Oh, we got music. Bye, bye. Uh, bye, 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 bye. How many of you are blown away how irrefutable and irrefutably clear the evidence for the Trinity is in all the New Testaments? How many of you are amazed at this? But now watch this one. This one's going to rock you. Here I am. Rock you like a hurricane. And on that day, God is speaking, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. <clears throat> and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of compassion and supplication. Here's the annihilation of Unitarianism, Islam, Rabbinic Judaism. So that when they look on me, God is speaking, whom they have pierced. Uh-oh. God says... The Jews, when I come to save them, will look on me, the one they had pierced. Wahibtu ille et ashir dakar. Dakar means to be pierced physically. <clears throat> to be pierced physically. When did the Jews physically pierce their God? But wait, I'm going to show you how they try to get around this. As one mourns for no one child. Now notice, the God they pierce, they're going to come to their senses. They're going to realize, we were the ones who had our God physically pierced, struck. And then they're going to start mourning, regretting, repenting. And they're going to mourn for their sin as when one mourns for the loss of an only child. And they're going to weep bitterly as one weeps over a firstborn. Is it a coincidence that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God and is firstborn? So this Jehovah, when they regret their sin against him, they're going to be weeping over what they did to him as the loss of an only child, the firstborn, which is who Jesus was. The only begotten Son, the firstborn of God. Okay? But... Who's going to mourn? The Jews. But why? Because when Jehovah comes, he's going to pour out a spirit of compassion supplication. Now, let me show you the Holy Spirit here. This is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be sent by God to convict the Jews and awaken the Jews and realize who this one was and move them to repent. So he's going to give them the spirit out of his compassion. They don't deserve it. And then the spirit will convict them and bring them senses Here's the one that you killed 2,000 years earlier. And he was the one who was your God, and you handed him over. And they'll be moved to cry out for repentance. Who's going to move them? The Spirit. See it? The Spirit. You guys got it? Before I move on, let it sink in.
And so notice, they'll look on me whom they pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. And then all the clans of Jerusalem will weep clan by clan. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be great, as great as the mourning of Hadad Riman in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn, each family by itself. The family of the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves. The family of the house of Nathan by itself. Now, this is important because in Luke 3, 23 to 31, if you read it, read Luke 3, 23 to 38. But if you read it to 31, there Jesus' genealogy is traced to Nathan, the son of David. And the evidence is that's the genealogy of Mary, which Joseph is representing. We'll do a session on that in the future, Lord willing. By the way, is Lepanto still here or he's asleep? The poor brother doesn't say much. Focus, everyone. All right. And their wives by themselves. The family of the house of Levi, Levi by itself. And their wives by themselves. The family of Shemites by itself. And their wives by themselves. And all the families that are left, each by itself. And their wives by themselves. And on that day, when they mourn, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and impurity. God is then going to cleanse them and forgive them on that day. Now, notice they will pierce Jehovah the first time around. But when he comes around the second time, they're going to recognize that's when they pierce. Now, understand how this proves two comings. He had to have been there before he showed up for them to recognize this is the one we physically thrusted. Because they didn't thrust him at this time. He had, a, who, he had to have been there previously, prior, for them to have him physically pierced. Then when he shows up again, then they recognize, oh, this is the one that when the first time around he showed up, we had him killed. We had him thrusted physically. So here you have the implicit affirmation of two comings. The first time where they had him physically pierced and the second time where they now realize their sin. And what does the New Testament say about this? Let me see if it's in this part. Yep, it's in this part. Remember it says, they will mourn for him as an only son? Here you go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Here's the only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whatever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. John 3, 16, 18. Now watch what John says. He quotes Zechariah 12, 10. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. Immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified. So he's saying, I'm an eyewitness. I was there. And here are these individuals that know me and will vouch for me. And his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you shall you may believe. Now watch. For these things came to pass, fulfilled the scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture. They shall look on him whom they pierced. Did you catch it? When the soldiers physically pierced him with a spear, John says, I saw it. And that fulfilled Zechariah 12.10. But hold on. That's the first coming. But it says when they see him, they're going to be convicted and realize this is the one they killed. When will that happen? You don't need to guess. I'm going to skip all this. It happens at the second coming, Revelation 1-7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be, amen. There you go. The first part fulfilled when he was pierced through by the soldiers with a spear. The second part when he returns, and all the tribes of the earth will recognize him and mourn. This is the one we pierce through. There you go. The two comings of Christ. You caught it or no? But hold on. Guess what? How do you get around that this is Jesus being identified as Jehovah? Now remember, Jehovah is spirit. Jehovah is spirit, right? How do you physically pierce? The word Dakar, in all instances except one, from my recollection, means to physically thrust someone through. Physically 
pierce through like with a sword. But he's spirit. How do you pierce him through? Because Jehovah became flesh. And that explains how Jehovah's feet can physically split the Mount of Olives. You remember Zechariah 14? His feet physically split the Mount of Olives because he has physical feet, because he has a physical body. And in that physical body, he was thrust through physically. Right? But guess what? Guess what some of the scribes, the later Jewish scribes did? The Mezarite scribes, when they started adding the vowel markings to, to the continental text, five years after Christ, some manuscripts read, they shall look on him, not they shall look on me. That's why the Joe Witness Bible and certain Bibles like Revised Standard Version read this way. But guess what? Here. Notice how Revised Standard Version reads. A few manuscripts, Hebrew manuscripts, read on him. Here. And the Joe's Witnesses go with that reading conveniently. And I'll pour out on the house of David, inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of compassion. And supplication so that when they look on him whom they pierced. But you want to see why God is amazing? You want to see why God is amazing? We have over 25,000 manuscripts of the biblical books preserved all over the world. Written at different times, different places by different people. And because of that, the original wording has been preserved, not lost. So we can then analyze the mass of these manuscripts, and recognize this is a variant. That's not the original. This is the original. Because we have Hebrew manuscripts written at different times, we know the original reading. And because we have ancient versions showing us what the original Hebrew said, we know that originally said on me. Yes, there are a few manuscripts that read on him. But the majority of our Hebrew manuscripts and ancient translations all acknowledge the reading is, they will look to me. Don't let them deceive you. Here it is. And I'm quoting a commentary. Here it goes. So let's, that's why we can't finish. An exegetical commentary, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, by Eugene H. Merrill M. Right here. Watch what the majority of our copies say. In this dispute inspection, the majority of Hebrew manuscripts read, They will look to me, the one they have pierced through. Game over. The majority of our manuscripts and ancient versions have me, not him. A few, however, read, To the one whom, etc., employing the poetic form of the preposition. Other Hebrew manuscripts, however, reflect a vorlage, that requires the running, they will look on me in place of him whom they pierced. Now watch. The end result is that it is not Yahweh who's pierced, but someone else. Now why would these scribes change it? Here's why. Number one, these are after the spread of Christianity. Where Christians were saying, Jesus is the Messiah, Messiah is God in the flesh. Quoting this verse to prove it. So number two, that led some scribes to then want to change it. And thirdly, number three, a Jew would have a hard time with Yahweh being pierced physically. Why? Because Yahweh is not physical. How can Yahweh say they will physically thrust me through? Because Yahweh became flesh. And here, clearly the notion of Yahweh being subjected to such a highly anthropomorphic, meaning in the form of man, anthroposmorphe conception, was more than some devout scribes could countenance. They couldn't handle that. No way our God can be physically pierced. He's not physical. The Hebrew evidence overwhelmingly favors the traditional reading of the Masoretic text. Sorry, boys. The Hebrew evidence supports they will look to me. There is no textual reason then for rejecting the reading, they will look to me. There is no evidence to reject it. The one they have pierced through. Difficulty lies, therefore, in the <clears throat> hermeneutical and theological aspects of the question. As to the former, the passage clearly teaches that Yahweh, the speaker, 
throughout in the absence of clues to the contrary, having poured out the spirit of grace, leading to the people's supplications, will be seen by them as having been pierced by them. Pierced by them. Amen, angels. That's what they're doing. May God bless them. Right? This will cause the people to break out and lament for him, the one over whom they will grieve as they would over the death of a firstborn son. It is immediately apparent that the shift in pronoun from they will look to me to they will lament for him is at the crooks of the matter. Why does he say they will look to me whom they pierce and mourn for him? Remember, God speaks in the third person. If Yahweh has been pierced through, who is the him who's being lamented? Or to put it another way, why should the lament not be for Yahweh, the one who has been pierced through? It is questions like these, of course, that gave rise to the textual options adduced above. So what's his conclusion? The most satisfying resolution, it seems, is to admit of a change in pronoun as a grammatical stylistic feature without a change of the subject. Do you remember what I said at the beginning? God will often speak of himself in the third person. That's why the change in pronoun, me and him, because in that same chapter, if you're reading, Yahweh speaks of I, my, me, and then Yahweh, him, his. God will often speak of himself, first person, third person. Are you with me there? That is, it is Yahweh throughout who's describing the situation, and it is he who is su the subject at every point. It is he who has been pierced, and he whom his people having come to their senses as to what they have done, mourn and repentance. From Yahweh's viewpoint, it is me that is a focus. From the standpoint of the people, it is him. They're looking to him whom they pierce, and God says that him is me. Such a transition from one person to another is not at all uncommon in Hebrew composition, especially in poetic and prophetic language. Do you see what we just did to Greg Stafford? Do you see what we just did to Christian witnesses of Jah? Because he worships a false jaw, a false Jesus, a false spirit, because the dragon has inspired him. He's been taken captive by the dragon. Yahweh will be physically pierced. Yahweh's physical feet will land on the Mount of Olives and split in half. We're almost done, folks, because I'm going to do the rest of it tomorrow, Lord willing. And here's another scholar, the late Reformed scholar, right? Watch here. Robert L. Raymond, Jesus, Divine Messiah, the New Old Testament, pages 145, 146. It's over for the anti -tri By the way, you just destroyed Muslims, Unitarians, <clears throat> Modalists, and Arians like Greg Stafford. It's over. Watch here. Some scholars, however, are not content to take the passage... <clears throat> But as it stands, they can't accept that it's Jehovah saying they pierce me. But make every conceivable effort to evacuate the passage of any and all reference to Messiah and his deity. Watch, though. These efforts begin, not surprisingly, with the expediency of textual emendation, meaning changing the text. But notice the facts, how awesome the Trinity is. Our God has preserved irrefutable evidences, manuscripts. Medical, scientific facts, historical, archaeological inscriptions to destroy the lies. Despite, despite the fact that the original Hebrew of 1210 clearly reads, they look unto me, and has the support, look, of the large majority of reliable manuscripts, the Septuagint, the Greek version, confirms it's the word me, the Old Latin, the Vulgate, the Syriac Pshitta, the Aramaic Targums, the Greek versions of Aquila, Samachos, and Theodosian, they all agree it's me. Some scholars and modern versions, such as the Revised Standard Version, the Jehovah's Witnesses, New World Translation of Holy Scriptures, Moffat's version have chosen to follow a minority of unreliable Hebrew manuscripts. Man. And have changed the unto me to unto him. Now, the presence of the third person pronoun in the following phrase is factual enough, <clears throat> but it is not a conclusive argument that the former first person, meaning me, reference, must be amended to harmonize with it. I say this on three grounds. 
three grounds why the reading is they should look on me. First is the fact that the reading unto me, as we have already no noted, is supported by the vast majority of ancient witnesses. Second, the unto me is by far the harder reading. What does he mean harder? Scribes would more likely take something hard to digest and smooth it out. For a Jewish scribe to see that God says they will look on me and their peers, that would be too hard for him to swallow. So guess what he would do? Smooth it out and change it. That is to say, it is readily conceivable why a scribe will alter change unto me to read simply unto. But it is not readily apparent why a scribe would change a simple unto to unto me. Why would a scribe change it to have Jehovah saying, they physically pierced me? That makes sense? Or would it make more sense that a scribe seeing that Jehovah said, they shall look to me whom they pierced and say, wow, that can't possibly be what Zechariah wrote. No way Jehovah says they pierced me. It must be a mistake. And then change it to unto him. You understand? Right? Even though he himself prefers the user reading and accordingly amends the text, H.G. Marshall, H.G. Marshall, who doesn't like the reading unto me, but admits, he admits the arbitrary character of choice when he writes, the point may be made, and in fact has been made, the unto is the easier reading. So I go with the easier reading. <clears throat> Hence, it is more probable that it is an error for unto me than vice versa. <clears throat> there is great force in this objection. Indeed, it so weakens the case for unto that those who feel the incongruity of the Masoretic text will have to resort to emendation. So he's admitting the reading unto me is harder. And because it's harder, it's more likely to be the original reading. But it can't be. Therefore, I reject it. See the logic? No, but it can't be an emotional piecing because... In all except one case, Austin, and I documented, the verb dakar, it's always used to physically cut someone through. And don't forget, in Zechariah 14, we're told by Zechariah, Jehovah has feet, because his feet touched the Mount of Olives, physically split it. No, it's physical, friend. They can't get around it. Almost done. And the third reason why it should be on me, third reason he gives, the shift from the first to the third person may be an instance of either the common in la ga, meaning that it's common for God to speak of himself first person, I, me, my, and then third person, him, his, right? He. A verbal number frequently met within the speeches of Yahweh. See the many instances where Yahweh, as a first person speaker, refers to himself in a given speech in the third person as Yahweh. Or the differentiation identity pattern we have already had occasion to note for the reader. Zechariah 12, 10, 11, Masoretic text 2, 14, 15, in which the Messiah is both personally identified with God and at the same time, in the same context, distinguished from him. Okay, did you see the argument? The massive, overwhelming Hebrew copies have, they will look on me. All the ancient versions, Greek, Aramaic, Shitta, Latin, have look on me. There's no getting around it. So then Christian apologist Ron Rhodes writes, and this isn't one of the best books written on refuting Joe's witnesses. One of the best books. Ron Rhodes, Reasoning from the Scriptures with Joe's Witnesses. Get it. It's one of the best. Pages 81, 83. Let's read it. You guys are not bored, right? We got five more minutes and we're done. Yep, pun intended. He concludes, here is the critical point. New American Standard Bible, it is Yahweh or Jehovah who's speaking in this verse. And it's therefore Jehovah who says, they will look on me whom they have pierced. Obviously, this means that Jesus is Jehovah. Damn. Stafford, why would you go to Zechariah, dude? Stafford, come home, son. Jehovah Jesus is waiting. The dragon has been crushed by the true Trinitarian Christians, because only the true Christians are Trinitarian, who worship the true God who's triune. We're crushing him by the power of Jehovah Jesus. But you're losing. He's deceiving you. Granted, there's some debate over how this verse should be translated. <clears throat> Following are what I consider to be the most important considerations. 
First, foundationally, it is very clear that Yahweh or Jehovah is the speaker in this verse. In fact, verses 2 to through 12 are the single discourse tied to thus declares Lord Yahweh in verse 1. So Jehovah speaking. Can't get around it. Third, assuming the correct translation has Jehovah saying they will look on me whom they have pierced. The New Testament portrays this verse as being fulfilled in the person of Jesus. See Revelation 1, 7 where Jesus is the pierced one. Thereby lending support for the idea that Jesus is Jehovah or Yahweh. However, a problem emerges with a cross-reference. John 19, 37, which I read, which reads, they will look on him. So why did John quote it as on him? Well, in part two, I explain it. Part two, I explain it. Make sure you read part two. It's all explained here. But he's, he's giving you the reason here. So why did John quote it? They will look on him when it's they will look on me. Seemingly lending support to the on him rendering of Zechariah 12.10, which would remove the Jehovah Jesus connection. It seems a complicated problem solved. My studied opinion is that the English Standard Version clarifies things rather nicely. More specifically, the English Standard Version, ESV, <clears throat> renders the relevant portion of the verse, when they look on me, on him. They will look on me, on him. I'm the him, he's the me, whom they pierced. This is not too unlike the NET Bible rendering. They will look to me, the one they have pierced. Similarly, the New International Version renders it. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. Because I am the one, I am him, he is me. Since Jehovah is the one doing the speaking, it is clear in these translations that Jehovah himself is the one who's pierced, thereby drawing the connection between Jehovah and Jesus. So now why does John quote it as they look on him? I can make one further observation. New Testament scholars have long emphasized that New Testament quotations of the Old Testament, when New Testament quotes the Old Testament, they're sometimes very loose, not exact. Sometimes they paraphrase. They're often loose quotations with little or no attempt at being exact. A change of pronoun from me to him is no big deal in the Hebrew mindset. And he gives you examples how the New Testament does this. To illustrate... Consider Psalm 68, 18, where we read, when you ascended on high, you led captives in your train. That's how it reads. But when Paul quotes it, in Ephesians 4, 8, the apostle Paul quotes this verse, but renders it, renders it with different pronouns. When he ascended on high, he led captives in his train. You see what he's trying to show you? The New Testament will quote the Old Testament, not always verbatim, but paraphrase it and change the pronouns. You with me there? You with me there? No big deal. Paul felt free to change the pronouns without fear of doing injustice to the word of God. I suggest the same is true of John 19.37. This is the burial. Guys, did you hear the evidence? Make sure you rewatch, reread until it becomes second nature. You owe it to Jehovah Jesus to now... Share these facts. Go on Discord, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, right? YouTube channel. Go to your church. Go home. Your neighbors. You owe it to the Lord. Teach them. Make sure you understood and share accurately. Material is yours. Take them. And I covered the change of pronouns in part two. So what do we learn? Jehovah God will be physically cut through, pierced through, and the Jews will realize their sin of having him physically pierced through and repent, showing the two comings of Jehovah. But for Jehovah to be physically pierced through, he must be in the flesh. And Zechariah 14 says, Jehovah's feet will touch. The model will split it physically. And now it makes sense because the New Testament tells us Jesus physically left the Mount of Olives, returned physically to the Mount of Olives, so he has physical feet. That means Zechariah was allowed to see Jesus return from heaven in his glorified, resurrected physical body.